excited. I'm almost like a little kid at Christmas time, you know. So without any further ado, I'd like to call up my friend, Vice President of the Historical Society, Ms. Liz Fuller. Harry was talking about was a coup. 
And um, that's not something that I associate with the United States of America. So we sometimes these days hear that term sort of have carelessly thrown about, but in reality, a coup d'etat is the violent overthrow of government by a small group. And that's just not something that happens here because we have a system. If we don't like our leaders, we wait a few years and we vote them out. Um, or if they're corrupt, we impeach them. But we don't overthrow them with violence. And but that's what he said happened. In fact, he said uh, it was a it was a four-step plan that these the people had. And he said it was it was carried out by political leaders and the white middle class uh, men of Wilmington. So the first step was to steal the election. The second step was to provoke a riot. And the way that they would do that would be by um, burning down the um, black newspaper office in Wilmington. And then they would stage a coup and force out the mayor and the aldermen and the, the chief of police. And finally, they would uh, find everybody that they felt would, um, would be against them and force them to leave town and never come back. So as I said, that's not the official version that uh, was around for a long time. Um, this, there was another version of the events of what happened, and that version was perpetuated by a man named Alfred Moore Waddell. And he called it the race riot of 1898. Now he didn't invent that term, but he popularized it. And um, unlike Harry, who was a little boy when this happened, um, Waddell was, was an adult. He was there when it happened, and in fact, he was one of the masterminds of the plan. So his version went a little differently. He said, yeah, it, it was sort of a four-step deal. But he said, first of all, they didn't steal the election. They won it. And secondly, they didn't provoke a riot. They put down a riot. He said, sure, they had destroyed the newspaper. And yes, a fire did break out, but he doesn't know how that fire started. And then afterwards, there was, there was violence that they had to respond to and put down. Following that, he said the mayor and the aldermen and the sheriff were so humiliated that they had been unable to, to keep this from happening that they offered up their resignations voluntarily, and that he and some other men had to step in and put people in their place, and that that's when he became mayor. And then he said that, um, sure, a lot of people left town, but they did that voluntarily just because they didn't want to live there anymore. So that, that was the, the version of the events that pretty much was believed for about 100 years. So the question is, why are there two stories? Well, Waddell and Hayden had very different agendas. Waddell was a politician, he was involved in the events, and he was very concerned about the legal and career consequences to himself and the other men who were involved in this. This was only 22 years after the end of uh, Reconstruction. Um, he was very concerned that the President of the United States might send troops down to Wilmington and occupy it again. And after all, he was a Republican President, the African Americans had helped put him into office, and he was worried if, if they knew the true story, there would be um, consequences. Hayden, on the other hand, um, was a little boy who wasn't involved. He was writing um, 40 years after the fact. He knew there hadn't been any consequences. And he, um, he wanted to tell the story, so he interviewed a lot of the people who were involved in, and wrote it up. Now, I want to make sure you understand, he did not do this as an investigative journalist who felt that the truth should be told and that people should, be, should have consequences. No, he admired the plan. He thought it was they did a really good job, and he thought if he captured that and wrote it up, that other cities would be able to learn from that and maybe do it themselves. Because the one thing that uh, Waddell and Hayden had in common was that they were unapologetic white supremacists. And whether uh, they were saying that the, the violence was spontaneous or whether it was planned, the one thing they both agreed upon was that it was necessary and that it was justified. So what was going on in Wilmington at that time? So um, you might be surprised to know that at that time, Wilmington was North Carolina's largest and most important um, city. They shipped tons of cotton around the world. It was a very modern city. There were street lights, there were electric trolleys, there was telephone and telegraph. It was 56% um, African-American. 20,000 people lived there, more than half of them were African-American. 
One in five of the businesses in, in Wilmington were owned by African Americans. Ten out of eleven of the eating houses. Twenty out of twenty-two barber shops. There were four uh, dealers in um, fish and oysters shipping those, and, and one of them was owned by African Americans. There was a um, this People's Perpetual Building and Loan was owned by African Americans and helped help them to um, build um, houses and commercial establishments. The most sought after craftsmen in Wilmington were African American, and you heard um, Marion just stepped out. You heard her talking earlier about um, her. Great grandfather, Caesar Evans, who had skills, and he took those with him um, after he was free. And it was the same thing. They were the, the tailors, the blacksmiths, the shoemakers, the stonemasons, the plasters, the plumbers, the wheelwrights, the brick masons, the carpenters. They had those skills when they were enslaved, and they took them with them and they taught them to their descendants. And when you go to Wilmington and you see Thalian Hall and you see Bellevue Mansion, they were built by African Americans. There was also a small but significant uh, middle class that was developing, so there were African-American lawyers, architects, teachers, principals, and collectors of customs for the port. There were six school board members, four or five deputy sheriffs, 14 policemen, two fire departments, a legislator, a register of deeds, four health officers, coroners, <coughs> postal workers, mail carriers, and one-third of the aldermen were African-American. Over 1,000 African-Americans owned some sort of property. And then there was that newspaper, the Daily Record, and it um, uh, was known as the only daily black newspaper in the United States. And the black male literacy rate was higher than that among whites. So in the 30 years following the end of the Civil War, a lot of progress had been made by the African American community in Wilmington. But as you can imagine, not everyone thought that that was a good thing. So, in order to understand what happened, you have to understand who the players are. And this is a little confusing because we still use some of these same terms, but what they stand for has changed. So you kind of have to think about what it stood for back then to understand what was going on. So there were the Democrats. These were the Southern Democrats. So when you think of Democrats in this context, think conservative. These were the, um, the older white men with money who did not like change. They were very conservative. They, a lot of them had been uh, Confederate soldiers. Then you had the Republicans. Republicans was the Progressive Party. It was new. It was the party of Lincoln. Um, it was made up uh, of uh, Unionists, people from the North, or people that sympathized with the, with the North, um, freed slaves and their descendants. Um, so if African Americans were fiercely loyal to the Republican Party, that's how they registered, and that's how they voted, because it was the party of Lincoln. Then there was a new party called the Populists, and they were progressive, and that was largely farmers and rural whites. So back then, if you were African American, um, you voted Republican. If you were white and you had money, you voted Democrat. And if you were white and you didn't have much money, you voted Populist. That's pretty much how the breakdown went. So at first, the Democrats were too concerned about this, the conservative party, because they outnumbered the um, Republicans and the populace, so that was fine. But then somebody realized that the populace and the Republicans had, they shared some, they didn't share everything as far as what they wanted, but they shared enough. They wanted more jobs, they wanted lower taxes, they wanted lower interest rates, they wanted public schools. And so they thought, you know what, if we work together, if we fuse together, um, we can maybe outnumber the Democrats. And so they formed this party called the Fusionist Party. And this is really significant and historical because it was the first time there was an, an interracial political alliance. And, um, and it, it was very historical and also turned out to be very powerful. So, now you know who the players are. I'm just going to show you a timeline, a little bit of what was going on back then. So we had the Civil War um, from 1861 to 1865. And then later in 1865, there was the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, and that ended slavery for except for convicts. Then we had the 14th Amendment that gave citizenship to everyone who was born in the U.S. And then a couple of years later, we had the 15th Amendment that gave the right to vote for all male citizens regardless of color. So boom, boom, boom. We got end of slavery, citizenship, right to vote, all by 1870. And any um, other states in the South that wanted to come back into the Union had to accept those amendments to the Constitution. 
In 1877, a reconstruction ended very abruptly and the Union troops all pulled out. And then for a while, the Democrats started, the Conservative Party started coming back into power. So in 1894 was the first time that the fusionists tried this, where they banded together and put up a slate um, for the, for the um, election. And it worked. So in that election, they sent a, um, a populist, populist Republicans won all the elections, including sending a uh, populist to the U.S. Senate. Two years later, there was an election for governor, happened again. First time there was a uh, white Republican governor in North Carolina. And remember at that time, the Republicans, that was the progressive. And then in 1897, the following year, Wilmington had an election, and the mayor was a fusionist, majority of the aldermen were Republican, and three of the, of the aldermen were African American. So, from the conservative standpoint, they were like, what the heck is happening? <laughs> all of a sudden, we're losing power. There have been a national election, a state election, and a local election, and they lost all three. So that was sort of what teed up what happened in 1898. One more thing I want to mention before I move away from the timeline is that in 1896, there was a very significant Supreme Court decision uh, called Plessy versus Ferguson. And you've probably heard of that. It's where they determined that separate but equal was equal. And that will become very significant in just a couple years after that decision was made. So before we go back to Wilmington, I want to um, touch on, oh, on post-war um, Smithville. I, so it should say Smithville slash Southport. It was Southport by 1898, but it was Smithville right before right after the war ended. Um, if you're from Southport, you, these names are probably familiar to you. Um, so I just want to talk about some of the people that were living here now. Uh, Southport was much smaller than um, Wilmington. There were about 1,200 people. About, uh, in 1890, about one in three were African American. Um, Melissa Jackson, she, uh, was, uh, she was a farmer, she was a midwife, she was a businesswoman, she was a philanthropist, and she owned over 900 acres of land uh, in, uh, around Jowertown Road. There was Frank Gordon, he was an educator, he taught many, many uh, African American um, children and adults to read and write. There was Abram Galloway, um, his picture's over there on that table. He was a veteran of the Union Army, and in 1897, he was the chairman of the Southport Republican Party. There was James Griffin, who was a property owner. He owned two of the original lots in um, Southport, so in city proper. His son, Whitfield Griffin, was also a property owner. He and his wife and a friend of theirs owned the land that uh, became the John M. Smith Cemetery. They, they gave that land to the community for the cemetery. He and Wesley Lee were both um, school committee members, not an African-American school committee member, but there was a Southport school committee, and they were both on it. Those were elected positions. Freeman Hankins built several houses on Red Street, so again, in the um, 100 lots. And Frank Davis was the first and only African-American postmaster of Southport. So progress was being made in Southport as well. Um, it was a much smaller community, but those are just a few of the people. Um, as from an election standpoint, from a political standpoint, uh, Southport was similar to Wilmington in that uh, the Democrats were in the majority. There were about 55 more Democratic votes um, it registered voters in Southport than uh, the other parties. But there was one election in 1887 that was kind of interesting. And what happened was um, the whites had two um, slates of candidates running, and so they were voting all day, and they were splitting their vote between those two slates. And the African Americans kind of held back and didn't vote until towards the end of the day. So the, most of the votes were in, and then they came in and voted and ended up tipping who became um, mayor, and then they also managed to elect four um, uh, aldermen, basically, to the, to the city council. So that sort of surprised people and was a clever way of doing it. It only happened once. So, okay, so that was that part. Now we'll go back to the, um, what was happening in the state, because it wasn't just Wilmington. It was the entire state of North Carolina that was in panic over what was going on. So, um, they, uh, they, they weren't really sure how they were going to um, get control back, but um, there was a man named Furnifold Simmons, and he was the head of the Democratic Party. And he said, I have a plan. I know how to fix this. And he said, we're not going to win on issues because they agree on issues. He said, so uh, what we need to do is we need to draw those white populists back into the Democratic Party. 
And the way we need to do that is we need to remind them of the importance of race. So he said, we're not going to run a campaign based on issues. We're going to run it based on white supremacy. And he said, I can do this, but I need men who can speak, who can write, and who can ride. So by speaking, he meant, you know, back then there was no internet, there was no Facebook, there was no television, there was no radio. The way that people communicated is that we give speeches, and then um, they would a lot of times get written up in the newspaper, and people would, would spread the word that way. So Alfred Waddell, who we talked about earlier, was one of the, the speakers, and he would give very fiery speeches. He was known for that. And there was one speech he gave in October of 1898 in Wilmington um, that has pretty much haunted Wilmington ever since. He said he would end Negro domination if he needed to choke the current of the Cape Fear with carcasses. It was very, very fiery rhetoric. Um, Herschel Simmons said he needed men who could write. So there was a man named Josephus Daniels, who went by Jody, so Jody Daniels. He bought a, a newspaper in Raleigh, the News and Observer. And he was uh, very much aligned with what Colonel Holtzman was doing. So he said, I'll make this newspaper the mouthpiece of the party. And so he set about publishing anti-black propaganda. Um, a lot of uh, newspaper articles um, exaggerated them and, and made stories up and really uh, put out a lot of, of stories like that. The, the Charlotte paper did um, to some extent as well, so did some, uh, some other um, newspapers around the state, but it was really led by Jody Daniels. And then uh, Frenkel said that he needed men who could ride, and by that he meant vigilantes. So there were a group of vigilantes in South Carolina called the Red Shirts, and so they uh, sort of emulated that, brought red shirts up here, and um, these were men that would, they would ride around or they would march around with rifles and guns and they would basically intimidate people anytime that they saw, you know, there was a gathering, of maybe a political gathering or people trying to register to vote or just any time that they felt there was fusion going on happening and they would try to stop people from, from doing that and, and intimidate them. So remember uh, I said that a large part of the population was not literate. So, Jody Daniels uh, was very uh, clever. He had a man that worked for him who was a very good political cartoonist. And he used him to great advantage. So, whether or not you could read or not, these political cartoons, the images of them were so powerful that they just really stuck with you. And I'll give you a few examples of some that he published. So, this one is from the Raleigh paper in August of 1898, a few months before the election. And as you can see, we have a white man being smashed under the boot of the Negro. And it says, a serious question, how long will this last? Then this one, a couple weeks later, was printed. And we see, it's kind of cut off, but you see this arm coming out. And uh, what's written on the arm is, honest white man. And then he's got this club. It looks like a club, but it's the ballot. And he's bludgeoning this caricature of an African-American man. And on his hat, it says, um, Negro rule. And the caption below, oh, it says, a warning. Get back. We will not stand it. And then the last one I'm going to show you was published just um, two weeks before the election. And in this one, we see this very dapper southern gentleman getting ready to vote, put his vote in the ballot box. And behind him, we see the devil. And the, devil, the word across his chest is fusionist. And he's reaching around behind the man, and he's just tapping his ballot into the box, and his ballot says, Negro rule. And underneath it says, don't be tempted by the devil. And then here is a picture of some of the red shirts who would roam the state and into the So um, we've talked a lot about this newspaper, that they wanted to destroy this newspaper, and that was a real um, big point in the campaign. So it's important to understand what was going on with that. Uh, so that started with a woman named uh, Rebecca Felton, who was the wife of a senator in Georgia. She's no relation to the Rebecca Felton that lives in South Carolina. <laughs> she, uh, she was a speaker, and she was asked to talk to the Farm Bureau and, um, and ask what were some of the concerns of the farm wives um, in, in, the, in the area. And so after reading all these articles that were being 
printed in the newspapers and all of this stuff, she said, well, one of the biggest concerns of farm wives is being raped. And so then she said, if it means lynching to protect women's dearest possession from the ravening human beasts, then I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary. So she uh, gave that speech in, in 1897, but um, the newspapers started picking it up in 1898 with, as part of the election. They were like, well, this is, this is good stuff. So they printed that. It was obviously very um, disturbing. It was especially disturbing to um, Alexander Manley. And he was the editor of the newspaper, The Daily Writer. And so um, Manley was the, um, the grandson of a former North Carolina governor. And um, his grandmother had been um, enslaved by the governor. And um, so Manley had actually, um, because of his family connections, he actually had some education. And he, he and his brother had started this newspaper. So he published this response. There's some question as to whether he actually wrote this article um, or not, but he definitely he published it. And he was certainly held responsible for it. So I tried to shorten it as much as possible, uh, but I wanted you to really understand part of what was in it, so I'll just read you parts of it. Um, it was a long article. He says, the papers are filled with reports of rapes of white women and the subsequent lynching of the alleged rapist. The editors pour forth volumes of aspersions against all Negroes because of the few who may be guilty. If the papers and speakers of the other race would condemn the commission of crime because it's crime, and not try to make it appear that the Negroes were the only criminals, they would find their strongest allies in the intelligent Negroes themselves, and together the whites and the blacks would root the evil out of both races. And then he ended it with, tell your men that it is no worse for a black man to be intimate with a white woman than for a white man to be intimate with a colored woman. You set yourselves down as a lot of carping hypocrites in that you cry aloud for the virtue of your women while you seek to destroy the morality of ours. Don't think ever that your women will remain pure while you are debauching ours. You sow the seed, the harvest will come in due time. So, that was not really well received among <laughs> a large part of the community. And there were a lot of people who called for his lynching, for, for publishing that. But Fern Furnival Simmons, remember he was running this white supremacy campaign, he said, no, 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 no. This is gold. And he said, I couldn't have asked for anything better to help with my campaign and make sure that not a hair on his head is harmed until after the election. So they didn't do anything to Manley at that point, and um, instead they kept publishing it in the newspaper. So they publish these articles every day and say, it's so horrible, that Manley's a horrible, horrible person for publishing this, he should have never have written this, he should be killed, and then they'd say, it never should have seen the light of day, and then they'd say, and if you'd like to read it, it's on page three. So <laughs> they were publishing And of course they were just publishing excerpts um, of the most um, upsetting parts. So that's, that's, um, that's kind of how they started with the newspaper, while the newspaper was important. But the other thing that this did was if there were any um, white men who were involved in this who had some qualms about you know, this fighting against Negro role that didn't really exist, um, they could turn it around. And all of a sudden now, they could feel good about what they were doing. Because they weren't the aggressors. They were actually defending you know, white womanhood and their virtue, and they were doing a good thing. So it, it really kind of helped solidify this, this base and, and help them to be more aggressive. Um, Hayden said, the white citizens of Wilmington and North Carolina became enraged over this unwarranted attack by the smart Alec Manley upon the virtue and character of Southern womanhood, which indeed was in flower in the entire Southland. So, um, the day before the election came, and Alfred Waddell, he just couldn't be quiet, he uh, had a, gave a speech the day before the election, and he said, you are Anglo-Saxons. You are armed and prepared, and you will do your duty. Go to the polls tomorrow, and if you find the Negro out voting, tell him to leave the poll, and if he refuses, kill him. Shoot him down in his tracks. We shall win tomorrow, and we have to do it with guns. Uh, so the morning of the election, there was an article on the front page of the paper that said, um, what will you be? Today, white men of North Carolina must declare where they stand. It's a question of race, not politics, in my book. Okay. Um,
Um, so, this is part of the um, article that was went with the paper. And the, um, so, and the, the compilation was in the article. I didn't, I didn't put it there. That's how it was printed. And it says, it's no longer a question of party, but of race. A fearful responsibility rests upon each voter, and the white men will mark and hold responsible each man who deserves his race. So they were no longer content with, with intimidating African Americans. Now they were intimidating um, white men who might uh, decide to vote with the Fusionist Party. Mm -hmm. So, who do you think won? <laughs> Here is the newspaper from the day of the election, and you can see it says, uh, white supremacy triumphs in the old North State. Um, victory sure and complete, Negro rule down.
So the next day, um, the newspaper printed the minutes of the meeting and the text of the declaration. And in the minutes, they said uh, that they intended to remove Alexander Manley and his newspaper from Wilmington and destroy his printing press. They also mentioned that they'd like to remove the mayor and the sheriff and the aldermen, but that they had tabled that suggestion as maybe being a little too radical. And then they said that what they had done is they had gathered together um, leaders of the African American community. And these weren't official leaders, these were men that they felt were influential in the community that had some sway. And they pulled them together and they read um, the Declaration of Independence and then they said that they wanted to get rid of Manley and his newspaper. So they tasked them with doing that. They said, you go do that. And so they said, well, we really don't have that authority, but um, sure, we'll give it a try. And they said, um, Okay, we want, we want that in writing, we want a letter, we want it delivered to Alfred Waddell by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. You can't deliver it in person. So they went away, they wrote a letter. Uh, one of the men in the group was an attorney, so they gave him the letter and asked him to deliver it. And for whatever reason, um, whether he didn't understand the directions, whether he was intimidated to go meet with um, Waddell personally, whether he knew his name was on a list of people that they didn't like, but for whatever reason, he didn't hand deliver it. He put it in a mailbox. So morning came, there was no, um, no letter. And um, so Waddell eventually, um, he, he went over to um, Thaline Hall where, where the white men were gathering. And there were at least 100, maybe more men gathered there. And they waited a while, finally at 8.30, um, Waddell said, well, we haven't gotten a response. Let's just take it in our own hands. We'll go do it ourselves. So they started marching over um, from Thaline Hall to Brooklyn where um, the printing press was. And so they marched over there, and as they were marching, um, more men joined, more men joined. They, uh, estimates maybe up to a thousand men uh, descended upon this, this part of uh, Wilmington. And when they uh, got there, they um, destroyed the printing press, and, they, um, and a fire broke out, and the building burned. So this is a picture of the men um, that they took afterward to show that they'd been there. Um, the newspaper office was on the second floor of the building, so you can see that's where the fire started. It's hard to see, but the, the people up on top um, that are African Americans and they're wearing um, helmets, um, those are actually uh, firemen. Because after the fire started burning a while, they got a little worried because the fire might get out of hand, and so they did call the fire department and they came over and they put the fire out and um, what else did they do? Um, so, when they were done uh, burning the building and taking their photos, um, what else said, um, okay, we're done here. And he said, we've come up with what we were planning to do. Um, now, you need to disperse, you need to go home, and you need to not look for trouble unless trouble finds you. And then he went, uh, he left and went to City Hall because he had more work to do. So, um, so the men started marching home. They were kind of pumped up, as you can imagine. At the same time, there were African-American men across town who had been working. And they started hearing rumors that there were fires in their neighborhood, that there were men marching around with, with guns, and they were very concerned. And so they left their jobs to go home. So they were coming into the neighborhood. At the same time, the, the white men were coming out of the neighborhood, and um, eventually they, they met. And as Hayden said, um, all hell broke loose. It's, it's impossible to know how many people were killed that day. We do know that there were three white men that were injured. Um, Waddell said there were between 10 and 11 African American men killed. Hayden documented 25. There are um, accounts that have been passed down in the African American community that it might have been 60 or 100. We really don't know. Um, there's several reasons that we'll never be able to find out. One reason is that the next day when they were permitted to go out and retrieve the bodies that were in the street, some people just got them and, and brought them home and buried them in their backyard. Um, they didn't want any more trouble. The person who had been killed might have been the person who was their protector, their, their husband, their brother, their father, their son, the person that kept them safe, and now they were gone. So they just wanted no more trouble. Um, there may have been some bodies that were thrown into the river, as Waddell had said. There were, when the, when the shooting was going on, when all this was going on, there were many, many people that, that fled. They, they ran into the cemetery, and then from, beyond, from there they went on into the swamps and hid. And women and children, um, it was November, 
They were cold, they had no shelter, they had no food, they had no water, they were frightened for their lives. Some of them never went back. They made their way on up into Virginia or down into Brunswick County, but never went back to Wilmington. Some of them um, did go back to Wilmington, but over the next few weeks and months, an estimated 2,000 people left Wilmington. So there was no way when it was done to just kind of look around and say, well, who's missing? That must be who was killed, because people were missing for a variety of reasons. So that was the massacre. Meanwhile, uh, Waddell had gone back to Bailing Hall, and City Hall was on the second floor. So he and his um, conspirators went um, up and met with the mayor and the alderman and the sheriff, who of course knew everything that had been going on, all the violence that was going on. And they forced them um, to resign, one by one, and they put their own men in place. And that's when Waddell became mayor. Then they marched them down to the train station, put them on a train, and said, don't ever come back here again. So that was the coup. They had a list of about between 20 and 25 uh, members of the community that they thought would not would be trouble if they stuck around. Uh, most of them were African American, but some of them were white men that they thought would not get on board with the new regime. So they rounded everybody up, they put them in the jail overnight for safekeeping, and then the next day they marched them to the railroad and again put them on a train and said, don't ever come back to Wilmington. Harry Hayden said, the men who took the, I find this chilling. The men who took down their shotguns and cleared the Negroes out of office yesterday were not a mob of plug uglies. They were men of property, intelligence, culture, clergymen, lawyers, bankers, merchants. They are not a mob. They are revolutionists asserting a sacred privilege and a right. So the newspapers agreed with Harry. Um, the, uh, the next day, the Wilmington Morning Star said, bloody conflict with Negroes, blacks provoke trouble, white men forced to take up arms for the preservation of law and order. Um, the Raleigh paper um, said a day of blood at Wilmington, Negroes precipitate conflict by firing on the whites, uh, 11 Negroes killed. Two weeks after this happened, um, Waddell published a story in uh, Collier's Weekly, the story of the Wilmington, North Carolina race riots. And that became the official version of the events. And this is the illustration that accompanied that article, so you can get an idea of the tone of what he was saying happened. So, we have two conflicting versions. Um, and when we have Waddell's version, it was spontaneous violence that they had to put down. And that was the official one. And then we have Hayden's unofficial version, uh, based on interviews he did about 30 years after it happened, um, with people who were involved. And it's important to know which is true. It's very important to know whether the violence was spontaneous or planned for months. But regardless, in both of these accounts, they're still only telling part of the story. They're entirely missing the African American experience. Where's the story from the perspective of the people who were living, working in Wilmington, who lost their husbands, who lost their fathers, their sons, their homes, their jobs, their community, and their sense of safety. Well, in the year 2000, North Carolina said, you know, we really do need to know what happened in Wilmington in 1898. So they put together a committee, and that committee spent about six years investigating it. And they tried, uh, they put together a 500-page report. And they tried to look at it from all perspectives, as much as they could from what, what evidence they could find, including using Hayden's book uh, and the interviews that he had done. And their conclusion um, was that Wilmington's 1890 racial violence was not accidental. It began a successful statewide democratic campaign to regain control of state government, disenfranchise African Americans, and create a system of legal segregation which persisted into the second half of the 20th century. So those findings are really important because you could look at this and think, well, 1898, that's a long time ago, why do we care? But the ramifications continued on until well into our lifetime. It wasn't until 1964 that the Civil Rights Act was passed. And we know that that didn't wave some magic wand that ended all of the bigotry and discrimination and violence. Some of the outcomes of the report were that the newspapers that were involved issued an apology uh, for their role in inciting violence. The Democratic Party issued an apology, 
Um, of course, the Democrats and the Republicans have shifted um, some of what they stand for in the, in the last hundred years, and I would be remiss, especially in an election year, to leave you with the impression that white supremacy is still a plank in the Democrat Party. The Democrats were the driving force behind the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. I also want to be sure that I don't give you the impression that Wilmington and North Carolina is the only place that things like this happened. There have been riots in this country with whites attacking blacks communities since the 1830s. There were riots in Ohio, Florida, uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and others. Um, and just like in North Carolina, they were not taught in schools. The significant difference with Wilmington, though, versus all those other riots, is that it really was not spontaneous. It really was planned by the leaders of the city who had money and power. So, once the Conservative Party was back in power, they began to change the laws. And remember I told you that Plessy versus Ferguson had been um, decided by the Supreme Court ruling two years before, and that was separate but equal. So, that enabled the government of North Carolina to start passing laws of segregation. So you may have heard of them called uh, Jim Crow laws. And they were a combination of laws and codes and customs. Now the reason that they did this, one of the most compelling reasons that they did this, if you remember the fusionist party, the collaboration between African Americans and, and whites, um, was, was that that was very powerful and thrown the conservative party out of office. So they never wanted to lose power again. And one way to avoid doing this, doing that, was to ensure that people didn't socialize again, that they didn't um, uh, work together, that they didn't socialize together, that they didn't um, worship together, that they didn't shop together, that they didn't um, play together. And they promoted a contentious relationship. And so through those, those Jim Crow laws, they really, um, ensure that people worked and played in different spheres so that they wouldn't be tempted to collaborate. So in Southport, that meant um, that the voting became all Democrat. Um, all whites were in position of authority. Churches, cemeteries, schools, restaurants, um, restrooms, they were all separate. The museum theater was segregated with white people down below, black people above. Um, professions that were not open to African Americans. It was fine if African Americans wanted to work on the menu but not that they be captains. And so opportunities were much more limited. Now, uh, we return to Hayden's book again. He said that these events eliminated the Negro as a political factor in Wilmington, North Carolina, and also led to the disfranchisement of the race throughout the South through the grandfather clause. In other words, they took away the right to vote. North Carolina changed its laws so that a literacy test was required for anyone whose grandfather had not voted in 1860. Seven, which was a um, fancy way of saying black people. And of course, they made the test so hard that no one could pass it. Uh, in addition, there was a lot of intimidation so that very few people uh, tried to pass the test. So in effect, as of 1900, the uh, right to vote was taken away from African Americans. And you can see how this all played out in Wilmington. There we go. Um, you can see before 1900, uh, African Americans um, were in the majority in Wilmington, and then by 1900, um, they were just below the majority, they, they, it was about even, uh, with a little more of white people than black people. And then from then on, um, the, the whites greatly outnumbered African Americans in Wilmington, and they never had the uh, majority again. I think now there's about 115, 118,000 people in Wilmington, and about 18% are African Americans. And from a voting perspective, you can see in 1896, two years before this happened, the Conservative Party only um, acquired 40% of the vote. Um, after this happened in 1900, two years later, 100% of the vote. So at that point, North Carolina became a one-party state. Okay, so that's all pretty discouraging. <laughs> my doesn't mark my for you. Um, the good thing is that um, about history is that it marches on. And there, there are always new generations being born who have the courage and the optimism to try and change things. So one of those people was named, named Anna Clemens. Anna was born in 1890, the same year as Mary Hayden, which means she was about 10 years old when voting rights were taken away from African American men. 
So Annie had a pretty ordinary upbringing. She grew up in Southport. She, um, when she was one of nine children. She never married. She lived most of her life with her parents, and she worked as a nurse, mostly in private homes. So I have a confession to make. When I found this picture, I was so excited because I thought, that's Anna. Um, but I've been told by people who knew her that that is not Anna. <laughs> so I don't have any other pictures. So this picture is a placeholder. It just sort of represents nurses in Southport about that time. So if anybody has a picture of Anna Clements, I would love to see it, make a copy of it. If anybody knows who these women are, that would also be really good to know. So it's sort of a placeholder. Just think of Anna as a nurse. Uh, so at a glance, there didn't appear to be anything extraordinary about Anna. But when Anna was 30 years old, she did do something extraordinary. Anna turned 30 in 1920, exactly 100 years ago. And 1920 was a very special year in American history. Does anyone know what happened in 1920? Oh, look at you! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we got the right to vote, 100 years! Anna said, well, I'm a woman. If women have the right to vote, then I should have the right to vote. And so she tried to register in South Florida. But she didn't have any um, success. But still, that was extraordinary enough that she did that. But then, instead of giving up like most people would, Anna did an even more extraordinary thing. She wrote a letter to the National Women's Party in Washington, D.C. And here's her letter. It says, to the National Women's Party, um, to the Secretary of the above party, I am an American colored woman, property owner, in Brunswick County, state of North Carolina, and I'm seeking a way to vote by mail if there is a way, because a colored person in my county is unable to vote because they are colored. Please send me information how to send votes or register to general headquarters by mail before it is too late to register. I'm obliged, Miss Anna Clemens, Box 294, Southport. I want to say there, there are a few letters that go back and forth between Anna and the National Women's Party. And I'm going to share this with you, but first I want to tell you these letters are on file with the Library of Congress and in the archives of the National Women's Party and in the NAACP. Isn't that something? Yeah. Woman from South Florida. So she received a response. Unfortunately, it seems like the women's organization didn't really understand her situation. So here's what they wrote. My dearest comments, your letter of October 10th inquiring about registration and voting by mail in North Carolina has just come in my hands. Registration must be made in person in North Carolina and in the precinct in which you live. It is possible to vote by mail and apply for a ballot to the county board. Registrations close on October 23rd. She received the letter on October 23rd. So. Um, as you undoubtedly understand, no one may register to vote outside his own precinct. We have been making inquiries and learned that colored women are being registered in North Carolina. Have you tried personally? If not, will, will you try and let us know the result? Should the registration board refuse to register you, we shall be glad to look into the matter and see what can be done about it. Please be sure to let us know the result of your attempt to register. Very sincerely yours, Emma Wool, Headquarters Secretary. So, uh, Anna wrote back, and she said, My dear Miss Wold, in reply to your letter, which was duly received yesterday, well, I will take the greatest of pleasure to write you my result in attempting or trying to register. I went before the registrator October 15th and was refused to be registered, as this board requires all color to be able to read and write to suit the registrator, and all persons of color origin in the whole county have been unable to suit the registrator. North Carolina laws require one to be able to read and write to register. Still, we have in our county ones to fill requirements, then they are refused. I hope and ask if you should have this matter investigated, then please do not let my name be brought into this matter, because there is so much prejudice existing until I am most assured I will be a victim of a lawless mob. To show you I am no agitator or race leader, I will try to explain just my position. I am a nurse, have nursed in most every home in this town for the past nine years, acting at times as assistant to one of the South's best surgeons, Dr. J. Arthur Dosher of this county. 
I donated to the Red Cross. I volunteered during the 1918 flu epidemic. I hold a certificate for heroic services rendered over my state. I own property and I pay my tax. I am a Christian belonging to the Methodist Church. I attend to my own business. I don't interfere with no race of people. And I try to live here as I expect to live when I pass into the great beyond. That is in peace. I have seven brothers, law-abiding, supposed to be citizens, denied the same as myself. Hoping and resting assured you will not use my name in this matter that I will close. From Anna Clements, Box 294, Southport, North Carolina. So they responded to that. Um, they, uh, so she did, uh, she ran the letter by Alice Paul, who presented the women's party, um, but unfortunately they were unable to help her any further. And here's what they wrote My dear Mrs. Clemens, I have called Ms. Paul's attention to your letter of October 24th describing the registration conditions for colored women in your neighborhood. We have been giving the situation in the South a good deal of thought, but at present we see only one solution to the matter, and that is one which is not available now. We feel that we must press through Congress an enabling act, which will place federal authority over the registration and election officials in all the states, and so make interference with or prevention of the proper execution of the election laws of federal offense. We had hoped to get this enabling act through Congress before its adjournment last spring, but did not get further than the introduction of the measure. We expect to be able to work with the passage of this act at the coming session of Congress. Very sincerely yours, Emma Bold. So the Women's Party was a little optimistic about how long it was going to take them to get that enabling act through Congress. Uh, it was another 45 years before the Voting Rights Act was finally passed in 1960. And unfortunately, Anna didn't live to see that happen. She passed away in 1956. So, one thing to remember is that Southport was the county seat of Brunswick County. So, the situation that Anna described in Southport meant that no one in the county um, could register to vote, not just in Southport. There is some evidence that by the 1940s, some voting was going on, although it might not have been, I don't think it was widespread. Um, by the 1940s, there was a Southport Colored Citizens League. And pictured here are the members of the executive board, Herbert Brown, Ephraim Swain, Elmer Davis. This is the only picture I have. If anybody has a better picture, he's right there next to me, high watching the play checkers. And Dolly Evans. She was the only woman on the executive board. Um, it's, um, and this letter is from the Southport Colored Citizens League to the superintendent of Brunswick County Schools. It was written in 1947. And the letter is signed by the members of the executive board. The letter is asking for funds to be used to help the local African American schools. The league helped to pass the school bond, and afterward, the funds were being used for the white schools instead of the African American schools, and they were upset. So I'll just quote the ending of it, and it says, uh, "We feel you are not keeping faith with us after having promised that if the bond issue passed and we took every registered colored voter to the polls to vote for it." that you would guarantee to us an adequate school building. Our people are hurt and ask that you give the colored people a hearing on the matter. Respectfully yours, the Executive Committee of Southport Colored Citizens League. So this shows that there were registered voters, African American voters in the 40s. But what exactly happened between 1920 and 1947, I don't yet know. So if anybody here has any idea or they know of somebody who might have an idea, I would love to talk to you to find out more. Um, but we also know that there was still suppression and intimidation going on in Brunswick County in the late 50s and in the 60s. Um, Donnie told me a story um, told to him by Jesse Bryant, um, president of Cedar Grove NAACP. And when he went to register to vote in Southport, um, because it was the county seat, he was given a literacy test, and the questions he was asked were, um, how many bricks are in the courthouse building? And how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? So, one last gentleman I'd like to mention is Captain Eugene Gore. Now, I'm not going to say too much about him because I know that Davis Sasselski is going to be talking more about him this afternoon and about his um, life as a Manhattan fishing boat captain. But I would like to mention that Captain Gore continued the work for voting and civil rights in Southport. 
1963, he was a founding member of the Southport NAACP, working for voting and civil rights. His first role in the organization was as a chaplain. Later, he became president, a position he held for 20 years. He was also vice president of the state conference of the NAACP. He was on picket lines. He heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak. He met Jimmy Carter at the White House. And he marched in Washington, D.C. In his role as president of the Southport NAACP, he and Police Chief Evie Leonard removed the last of the signs on the courthouse that said, Blacks only and Whites only. Now, I admire Captain Moore a lot. And another thing I admire about him is that he had a sense of history. He knew he was living through history and that it should be documented. So he participated in oral history interviews that we have in our archives at the Historical Society. You can go to our website tonight and listen to him speak or read the transcripts of his talks. And because he did that, we have a much richer understanding of what life in Southport was like in the 20th century. So we at the Southport Historical Society just happen to be working on our oral history project program. We're trying to capture as many memories and stories from as many people as we can so that we have a richer and deeper understanding of life in Southport. And we feel a sense of urgency to do this before it's too late. Now most people will listen to this presentation and think, well that's fine for other people, but I don't have any more of the story. I don't have anything big to say. I didn't live through any important historical events, and then they won't do anything. But I know you do have a story. You do have memories. And if you don't share your experiences, someone else will write the story for you. Or just as bad, they will forget that anything happened. You may just have a few memories of what it was like to grow up in Southport, or what, how it was to get your first job, or how it was to raise your children here. And, um, or you may have stories that have been passed down from your parents and your grandparents. Not everything has to be big and dramatic and political. There are a lot of everyday happy stories, and those are valuable too. Um, or maybe you have some family pictures uh, that you haven't looked at in a while. Um, and who knows, maybe one of them there's a picture in there of Anna Clemens. <coughs> or one of the other people that I showed you today. Or your own family. And that's all great, because we at the Historical Society want to hear it. And um, we can add your tiny story to your neighbor's tiny story and then throw in a few family photographs and then we'll put it into the context of what was happening in history at that time. And before you know it, we have enough information for an exhibit or a presentation or a class. And we'll put it on our website and keep it for everyone to see. So um, we're passing around some sign up sheets. Please put your contact in info down if you even think you might have something to say. And, uh, or if you have some photographs or some letters, we will copy them and get them back and we will not harm them in any way. And then if you do that, um, I will contact you or Donnie will contact you because he's on our board of directors now. Someone will contact you. So please help us capture the full story of Southport and Brunswick County's history and let us help you tell your stories. And if you are um, interested, I, I know a lot of you knew about the Bloomington Rebellion, but if you want to know even more, I've just scratched the surface of the story, as you probably know. Here's a list of um, resources that are very good, and I just, I'll leave it up here in case you want to snap a picture if you want to um, follow up on any of those um, resources. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.